morning. As we uh, continue to worship this morning, we're going to go into our next song called Worth It All. And uh, this week, or today, not this week, today, uh, Pastor Wade is going to be preaching on, I think, uh, Mark and, and, and trying to see where where God is working uh, in your ministry. And, and then sometimes each one of us, hopefully, in our in our daily walk has a ministry of some sort. Maybe it's we minister to the people we work with. Maybe it's uh, we volunteer to work a, a youth camp. Maybe we volunteer at church. And then there's, there's sometimes that we're just trying to find our way. And, and I think that's what Wade's going to, uh, to, to focus on this morning is finding our way uh, in the midst of when we're kind of lost. Um, there's stories and stories within the, the Bible talking about um, being lost and, and, and trying to find our way. And, and sometimes it's really hard to do, but I think in those times when we're, we're looking to where we're headed, it, you have to take our eyes off of ourselves and, and, and really focus in on God. And this next song, Worth It All, um, kind of speaks to that. And I don't understand your ways. Oh, but I will give you my song. I'll give you all of my praise. And you hold on to all my pain. And with it, you are pulling me closer and pulling me into your way. Now around every Side of your face is all that I'm needing. I will say to you, it's gonna be worth it. It's gonna be worth it. It's gonna be worth it all. I believe it. It's gonna be.
church at this time. If you want to continue to stand for worship, you're welcome to stand, or you can have a seat if your legs are getting tired and you want to sit down and just meet with God sitting down. Um, let's bow our, bow our heads. Father God, we just thank you for bringing us here, God. God, we, we come here to, today to worship you, to give you praise, to meet with you. So God, we just, now we invite your spirit here, God. We open our hearts to you, God. God, that in a minute when Pastor Wade comes up for, to give his, the message, God, that it will be your words that we hear. God, we lay down everything that might be clogging up our minds this morning, anything that's distracting us. We shake out the cobwebs, God. <laughs> we want to hear from you today. Lord, as we continue in worship, we just we open ourselves up to to whatever you have for us today. It's in your son's holy and precious name we pray. Amen.
And be seated. That was uh, that was amazing. What a what a wonderful time of worship, and even got a seminarian up here. Got uh, I don't know if, if they introduced uh, Jeremiah earlier, but uh, what a what a great addition uh, this morning. Coming all the way down from Wilmore, Kentucky, what I used to refer to, still often refer to as the Holy Land, where where Asbury Seminary is. I got to go to seminary. Um, up there, so uh, what a what a wonderful time! It gets cold, it gets cold up there in uh, in Kentucky. But um, this time of year, we got the hundred degree heat and ninety eight percent humidity, and uh, they think they're about to die when it's eighty two degrees and and dry. So, anyway, uh, speaking of dry, I grew up farming. I was a farmer. Uh, we grew cotton and maize sometimes. Uh, wheat and oats, and it always started with a seed, planting the seed. Now, um, one of the things about planting seeds, uh, as we get into Scripture in a bit here, uh, farming techniques of biblical times were less than perfect. Um, sowing seeds today is more than just grabbing a handful and, and slinging stuff at will. Um, my dad never told me, okay, boy, just go grab a bag of seeds and start slinging. Just get out there and go for it. No, we, we actually had a little bit more method to our planting. We had a big planter that we pulled uh, when we planted cotton that we pulled behind a tractor. And what it would do, it had um, this plow, a sweep. Uh, you know, look like it was a plow, and it would go along, and it would make a furrow, and then we had this bucket that we poured the seed in that would sit kind of right behind that, and it would drop seed into the little uh, rut that, that, that went along. And then behind that, there would be a couple of discs that would come along and, and cover up the seed. That's how we planted cotton. But, uh, it, and, and, and then after that, um, we made sure that the, uh, the, you know, the field was... was uh, cleared and everything before that happened and then then after the seeds were planted we made sure that you know it continued to be free from weeds and stuff like that which usually meant that I walked up and down these rows of cotton with a hoe you know digging up everything that 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 came up that wasn't cotton uh, any unwanted plants and things like that and over the course of several weeks and and so forth we'd fertilize uh, the crops and 
it, if we had irrigation systems set up, we'd water the crops. We took care of them. Sometimes we had to protect them from pests and uh, you know, insects, things like that. But eventually there would be a harvest. And I can tell you that all the things that it takes the, for the farmer to do in order to have a cotton harvest or what have you. But what I cannot tell you is how cotton grows. I cannot explain to you where life comes from in these plants without offering to you the miracle of God. While planting is important, and the farmer is important, and you are important in the kingdom of God, you're not the only thing at work in the kingdom of God. God is at work in the kingdom of God. So if we turn to Mark's gospel, chapter 4, beginning with verse 26, we read a couple of parables that Jesus puts forth. He also said, The kingdom of God is if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle because the harvest has come. He also said, With what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable will we use for it? It's like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth, yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs, puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. See, we are not the only thing at work in the kingdom of God. And sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we think that our actions are the only actions. We can go back all the way to the beginning of the Bible, to, to Genesis, to see an example of that. Uh, you're familiar probably with Abram or Abraham and Sarai or Sarah. God changed their names along the way, but same people if you've heard. Anyway, Abraham... God promised Abram, the old guy, that he and his wife would have many offspring. Sarah, his wife, not that Sarah, but Sarah, his wife, uh, decided that that just was not possible because she was too old. See, she was under the mistaken idea that she was responsible for making this happen. She was under the mistaken idea that she was responsible for making this happen. So what does she do? She goes out and finds a younger, fertile girlfriend, it says wife, but, you know, uh, for her husband. Any fool can tell you that is a bad, bad idea. It's not a good idea. It's like she said, I trust God, but not enough to believe that he will actually fulfill his promise. I've got to make sure by being in control. Well, that's the thing. We're not in total control. We have to have faith that we're fulfilling our role by participating, by planting seeds, by watering, by fertilizing. But ultimately, the growth is something that God does. Perhaps that's the purpose of this parable. We know who gives the growth and the harvest. We just don't know how. It's for us to wait, to trust, to have faith. But be assured there will be growth when we sow seeds. Just not at our direction or under our command. So what does that mean for us? You don't just throw seeds out there and walk away. Farming is hard work. It's hard work and faith. But any farmer... Any farmer will tell you that no matter how hard they work, how early they get up in the morning, how late they go to bed at night, how uh, many miles they walk up and down the rows, how sore they get, any 
farmer will tell you that no matter how much work they do, and you know, uh, they can work harder, uh, just as hard, if not harder, than anybody. But all their hard work matters not if God does not provide the growth. The miracle of life doesn't happen. Doesn't happen without God, no matter how hard the farmer works, no matter what the farmer does. The miracle of life comes from God. Growing corn, growing cotton, growing whatever simply cannot be done outside of God. Farmers are people of faith. To dare to plant a seed is to put yourself at the mercy of the future. To risk failure. To submit to factors beyond your control. My mom used to have a sign in our kitchen that said, pray for a good harvest, but keep on hoeing. God says, my word doesn't come back to me empty. Only through the work of God, only through the work of God do we take, do we dare to take a small seed, a small mustard seed, plant it in the ground, and expect a great bush, an eventual bush. That's the kingdom of heaven. That's First United Methodist Church. What begins is something small and insignificant, a mustard seed, and through God's mysterious work, becomes great. Now, most of you know that Christ's Kitchen is a ministry of First United Methodist Church, and uh, it began, Christ's Kitchen began as a response to a study on world hunger that the United Methodist women did back in the mid-80s. It was clear that Victoria had a hunger problem. The oil industry was in a slump. There were a lot of the uh, surrounding areas that were economically depressed. And they explored the idea of combining the efforts with other churches to establish this soup kitchen. The building was secured, renovations began and so forth. And, and as, uh, uh, as I understand it through reading um, Walking Orderly, a history of First United Methodist Church, back in March of 1985, they opened for business. March of 1985, they fed five transient men peanut butter and honey sandwiches and coffee. More kitchen equipment was acquired and was installed. Ten months later, they were averaging about 25 to 30 hot balanced meals a day. Now fast forward 35 years, 2020, the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, and Christ's Kitchen is serving over a thousand hot meals a day. Right now, they're continuing to serve over 600 hot balanced meals a day. I want to tell you something. I admire those UMW women, the people that organized that kitchen and the volunteers that make sure that that kitchen is operational and serving the community today, they're an inspiration. By the way, First United Methodist Church cooks uh, the meals uh, for Mondays. Now, often that's done uh, on uh, Saturdays, sometimes Friday uh, afternoons. If anybody's interested in helping out there, just call up to the church office and we'll get you in touch with the team leaders and, and you can help be a part of that. The other thing is, the other way to, to help out is you, if you don't even want to call up to the church office, just show up on a Monday morning uh, or any morning for that matter uh, because they need volunteers. So uh, if, you, if you're looking at, at, at uh, wanting to help out, just show up at Christ's Kitchen. They'll find something for you to do uh, to help at Christ's Kitchen. Uh, now, I, w- I was about to tell you something about Christ's Kitchen. I kind of got into that volunteer, uh, asking for volunteers mode. But uh, Christ's Kitchen started as a seed. And it's been watered, fertilized, and tended to. But make no mistake, without God providing the growth, it would have simply remained a study on world hunger. Let's face it, there's not a whole lot that a small group of ordinary people can do 
in response to such a vast problem on their own. But they prayed about it. They sought God's direction. And they fed five men peanut butter sandwiches. And now look. How? How did the prayers and the efforts of these few people bear that sort of harvest? Because God is at work. Maybe Jesus tells these parables so that they might be a lens through which we can look at ourselves and our own participation within God's realm. Sometimes we think we have to do it all, like Sarah. We feel like it's up to us and us alone. Sometimes that keeps us from moving. That keeps us from taking action. The thought of Jesus asking us to do something so big, so extraordinary, so out of our comfort zone scares us because we still think we've got to do it all by ourselves. We think we've got to do it on our own. The kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself. First the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with the sickle, the sickle because the harvest has come. What is God calling us to? What are the seeds that we're being asked to sow? When have we, have we been afraid to cast seeds? Have we thought to ourselves, you know, there's just some things that we simply cannot do. Do we sell God short by not recognizing that God is at work too? Now, over the coming months, over the coming years, I believe that God expects First United Methodist Church to partner with Him. I believe God will call on us to sow some unexpected seeds. Too many churches sit back and rely on the work that came before them. We take on a mission to preserve and maintain the status quo. Sometimes we feel like we're honoring the ones that came before us. We're honoring their commitment to sowing seeds. Well, it's not our duty to honor their commitment. But even if it were, even if it were, how better to honor them than to follow in their footsteps and plant our own seeds you know, I was uh, in, in, in uh, wanting to make sure that I got the story of Christ's Kitchen as accurate as possible, going back and looking at that uh, walking orderly book, A History of First United Methodist Church. I was struck by something else. Um, in, in the late 1950s, early 60s, they tore the church down and rebuilt the, that, that, the sanctuary in there was... The old one was torn down, and the new one, they went down and, and, and worshipped, I think, at the, at the, uh, the theater down here uh, while building a whole new building, a whole new sanctuary. Now, I'm not saying we need to tear anything down and, and, and all of that, but what I do want to say is imagine their thought process in going through that, their commitment do you think they thought, oh, we could do this on our own? Do you think they would have had the guts to do that without recognizing and realizing that God is at work with them, sowing that seed with the confidence, with the confidence that God was calling them to do something out of their comfort zone, knowing that it wasn't something that they could do on their own, tearing down a church building building a new one with an eye towards the future. That's what we're called to do. Not necessarily to tear down church buildings, but with that eye to the future, to look to the congregation and to the community and to say boldly, God is with us. Who can be against us? We're not in the preservation and maintenance business. We're in the make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world 
business. And for us, transformation of the world begins right here in Victoria, Texas. And guess what? In our, in our parables today, Jesus didn't talk about planting a full-grown mustard bush. He didn't say, plant this full-grown bush and it will yield a harvest this afternoon. We transform Victoria, Texas by making sure tomorrow's leaders, tomorrow's teachers, tomorrow's doctors, city council members, police officers, pastors, tomorrow's moms and dads, tomorrow's grandparents, have found a relationship with Jesus Christ through First United Methodist Church. Children, youth, young adults, these are the seeds that we need to be investing in heavily. Tomorrow's leaders are in diapers today. Tomorrow's leaders are sticking their tongues out on the playground, pulling pigtails and making mud pies. Tomorrow's leaders are navigating puberty and the perils of being a teenager. Tomorrow's leaders are sleep deprived because they stayed up all night with a sick kid. So I want to ask you a couple of important questions to ponder on, to think about as we kind of wrap things up today. What does Victoria, Texas look like in 20 years if we don't help these seeds establish a relationship with Jesus Christ? And what does Victoria, Texas look like if we do everything we possibly can, if we do everything in our power to make sure that these seeds have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, of course we wish there were more of us here in this church on this early summer Sunday. We wish that the financial offering we'll take in a bit would be larger. We wish each week it were larger. We wish we could see more visible results of our witnesses in the neighborhoods we live in, not to mention Victoria as a whole. And yet you have promised us that if we go ahead and do your will, playing our bit parts in your drama of salvation, that you will bless our efforts. You will bring to fruition the works that we sow. You'll work to make our words mean more than we can make them mean. And as we worship today, instill us with new hope and confidence that the seeds we scatter in word and deed shall bear fruit. We thank you for your work among us, beyond us, sometimes even in spite of us. Amen. Church, will you please join, stand and join us in the closing song? Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the praises of the King rise among us. Let it rise. Let the songs of the Lord rise. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the joy of the King rise among us. Let it rise. Oh, let it rise. Oh, let it rise. Let the glory of the Lord rise. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us.
among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the praises of the King rise among us. Let it rise. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the joy of the King rise among us. Let it rise. Go ahead and have a seat if you like. Uh, we're going to offer some prayer um, for some uh, texted in uh, prayer requests and things like that. But as we, uh, as we prepare to go forth today, a couple of things that I'll point out. Um, if you're interested in getting involved, um, there's lots of different ways. There's a, a, a little uh, booklet on different opportunities for involvement back here at our First Connect tables where Carrie is, uh, and uh, she'd be happy to talk to you. I'll be happy to talk to you as well. I'll make my way back there after, our, uh, after uh, the, the service is concluded. Um, let's go ahead and, and continue to keep our uh, youth in our prayers. They have gone off to, uh, to, to um, Colorado on that mission trip. I thought about being here at 4.30 this morning to help send them off, and then I thought, why deprive Pastor Ryan of his last week of, you know, I, he can, he, just let him do that, right? Uh, so, uh, but keep them uh, in, in your prayers this week. Uh, that's one of the ways that we uh, continue to be the church. Um, we also, as we offer prayers, we offer our, our financial offerings. So there's uh, baskets back there. If you have uh, an offering that you'd like to give uh, at our First Connect tables, drop those in the baskets. We also have uh, on our Be the Church mobile app, opportunities to give, as well as on our website. I invite you to, uh, to do that as well. Uh, so let's, let's go to God as, in prayer as we uh, prepare to, to go forth uh, and as we lift people up in our midst. Mighty God, we come to you raising our joys and, and our concerns today. Uh, we give thanks for the youth, the young people, we ask your blessing on Pastor Ryan and Missy as they uh, wrap up their time with us, head to Austin to continue their ministry at Oak Hill United Methodist Church. Lord, we ask your blessings with Pastor Amanda and her family as they come to walk alongside us, sowing those seeds, tending to your mission field, knowing that you are with us, taking bold steps. Lord, we lift up Paul Erdelt, dealing with metastatic prostate cancer. Tommy Gardner, new liver treatment for liver cancer, new treatment for liver cancer. Lord, bless and heal Shannon Myers having surgery on Tuesday. Be with Benny Ballou, Lois and Morris Asbill. We ask your traveling mercies for Joy and Robert Tripson, traveling to and from Georgia. But we ask your comfort to Matt Aby, the deaf, the longtime pet. Lifting up others also dealing with terminal illnesses, those struggling with mental health issues. Lord, we pray also for Junior and Ruth Grossman. There are others, Lord, that, that we hold in the silence of our hearts. 
those that haven't, those, those prayer requests that haven't been texted in, but remain on our hearts. Lord, you know them, you hear them, and you feel them. So we ask that though we know not how you intervene, we know not how you provide that comfort, we do know that there is a peace that only you can provide. There is healing that only you can provide and that there is comfort that only you can give. So we ask that. We ask that in your precious, mighty, and holy name. Amen. Amen.